Hey guys, it's Biggs. I'm really stoked today. I actually just got home and I have to do this video completely off the cuff, completely impromptu without any backup whatsoever. No preparation, nothing done in advance. I just came back from uh, one of my customers, which is Aficionados, which is a fish wholesaler local to us. Now, most of you guys wouldn't even know about it, but in Canada, we are faced with a massive, massive struggle of trying to get any fish actually into the country. There's only actually three airports right now globally that we can get fish from into Canada right now because none of the Canadian carriers will handle any sort of cargo from outside of the country. So it's a lot of challenges. Basically, today, I happen to be in the shop at the right time, the exact moment when something magical happened. And this thing is very, very near and dear to me. A gentleman walked in uh, and he brought some fish in and they were fish. Not only were they fish that one that I've been wanting to get for a while again, because I had this fish back in the 80s, which we'll talk about a bit more in detail here in a moment. But uh, this fish was actually more near and dear to me because this friend of mine, this is an old picture from years ago, but this is my dear friend, Mr. Hugh Rodriguez. And he was a friend for many, many years, and he passed away a few years back. And uh, this gentleman, these fish that came in were actually descendants of some of the fish that he had when we cleaned out his tanks back in the day after he passed away. And he kept that fish, that, that fish going for years and years and years. So I'm really, really stoked not only to have the fish back in my fish room, but two, knowing that it came from my good friend Hugh. So really, really cool to me. So today, we're going to go and take a peek for an unboxing and see what it is. I'm pretty stoked. Now we don't keep our fish frozen up here. This is actually a frozen uh, shipping box for Hikari fish foods, but I had to grab a little cooler. We're getting down, it's starting to dip down a little bit here. We're nowhere near freezing yet up here in Canada, but it's starting to get a little bit cooler than a tropical fish hailing from the dark continent. Now this fish here is absolutely near and dear to me. I remember back in the 80s keeping this fish. There's a nice big bag of them. We're trying to figure out what they are, bigs. We don't even know. But back in the 80s, when this fish came on the scene, it came from West Africa. So that's a, there's a bit of a clue already. It is a super popular aquarium fish in the trade today. And it should be because it's got an absolutely amazing personality. The fish in question today is the buffalo head cichlid, Steatocranus casuarius. Blockhead cichlid, lionhead cichlid, it doesn't matter. When it comes to frontal gibosities in cichlids, we all know what that is, that big noggin, that giant forehead in the dominant males, more prevalent in a lot of the Central American cichlids, which we'll show some pictures of and stuff. You know, those big noggins are characteristic and everybody loves that big noggin and stuff. But buffalo heads take it to the absolute extreme. And I'll show you the dominant male that we've got in this bag. I didn't bring home babies. I didn't bring home fry. This guy brought down a bucket full of adults. So I was able to hand select a couple of gorgeous males and three young females and stuff like that. And we're gonna try and toss them into one of the tanks in the room. Now the problem is the tanks in the room, we've got the two 160s. They're pretty established for their pecking order for what goes in there, but also the 160s are on a well water automatic wire change system. And well water is very hard water, very decidedly different than West African soft water. Now granted, this species has been in the trade for a long time in captivity, and it's adapted to a wide diverse arrays of water chemistry, but I'm very, very much a naturalist, a purist. I like to try and keep everything as natural as I can, even though this fish is hundreds and hundreds of generations away from its uh, original ancestors back on the dark continent. I still like to give it that type of a home. So I'm thinking it's gonna go into the tiger barb tank. Now most people would think tiger barbs big, they're too aggressive, they're nippy. That's because tiger barbs, as you guys have seen in the tiger barb video, which we'll post up here, or maybe it's up there. I don't know, but it's gonna be up on one of those spots. The Tiger King video, as we talked about, tiger barbs are often maligned in the hobby because they're fin nippers, because they're generally kept improperly. If you keep a big enough group with them where they have their social pecking order, they tend to leave everybody else alone. But I've got that nice dark water, 75 gallon tiger barb tank. I think these guys will fit in absolutely perfect. So let's go take a look. Now this is the 75 gallon tiger barb tank. You can see it's got a nice, it's got some tannin waters. I haven't introduced a lot of new botanicals to the tank, so I'll probably do that when I go and add these fish to the tank. It just got a big water change done out on the past weekend. Uh, it's all been kind of cleaned up. There's a video coming out right away on hair algae, which will probably come out prior to this video. And it was actually this tank that the hair algae was the nuisance issue in, and it's since been eradicated and cleaned up. And that was done on the past weekend. But this particular fish we're going to be adding in here 
hails from the, the lower Congo region, the Stanley Pool region around Matadi, and it's a very, very fast water rheophilic species. Rheophilic meaning it lives in waters that would be equivalent to like class five rapids. Super high dissolved oxygen content in the water, and the really, really cool and unique thing about this particular species is that it has a greatly reduced swim bladder. So it doesn't actually swim. It kind of hops around like a goby on the bottom of the tank. It darts up and grabs food morsels. And then if it stops swimming, it just basically starts to sink right down to the bottom. This adaptation has allowed it to adapt to living in these type of environments where it can capitalize on food sources and environments that other fish cannot. So it makes it a very, very cool addition to most, most tanks. It's not overly aggressive. They max out at usually about four, four and a half inches in size. And as you'll see, the males that I'm bringing in are full grown adults already. I think it's gonna be a really, really cool addition to this tank. So let's get them floating. Now you can see on this dominant male, his frontal gibosity or head growth is very, very impressive. This is a secondary sexual characteristic that makes him one of the more dominant males in his environment. Always the, the most dominant male, kind of like a silverback gorilla, the most dominant one will always have that secondary sexual trait. And now we got three young females. I think these guys are going to do just great. Now, because the water chemistry where these guys are coming from, they're coming from the city of Winnipeg, the water chemistry is vastly different. Now, either my well water is far too hard compared to Winnipeg water, or in the case of this aquarium, this tank here is almost 100% straight reverse osmosis water, and it's just buffered using Seachem Alibrium to maintain the pH at about 7, 7, 7.2. So these guys here, instead of actually floating them, that's only going to acclimate them to temperature-wise. I'm actually going to go and put these guys and release them into a bucket, and then we're going to slowly drip water from the aquarium into the bucket, and that will change the water chemistry uh, very, very gradually to meet not only temperature, but all the other water parameters as well. So let's get these guys dripping. It's such an impressive species. Now back in the 80s, when this fish was first imported in the 80s, these fish were, it's hard to believe now because everyone keeps them today pretty easy, but back in the day, these were an extremely challenging species to keep alive because they come from such turbulent, high oxygenated water when we brought them into the aquarium trade, they often did not fare very well. First, they didn't handle the transport all the way from West Africa all the way to North America, and, and losses were fairly heavy at the beginning. But secondly, uh, most of us were keeping fairly basic aquariums. Uh, back in the day, we were using under gravel filters driven by air uh, or sponge filters. And back in the day, that, this fish did not appreciate that type of an environment. Now, I was very, very successful with this fish. I believe it was the late 80s, 80s to early 90s, the first time, or sorry, second time that I had it. The first time I had it, obviously, I, I, it did not do very, very well. But the, the second time that I had the fish, it did very well for me. And what I did differently is I took an old school Hagen 55 gallon tank. Now, the dimensions on that tank were 36 by 18 by 18. As I mentioned, the primary filter at the time that was popular was under gravel. But these guys are notorious diggers. Uh, their eggs are known to be light sensitive. I don't know if that's been disproven or not, but back in the day that was always the theory that the eggs were light sensitive. So they always had to be in a cave that was dark or underside of a piece of driftwood. So we often used to use clay flower pots inverted upside down and just punch the hole on the bottom a little bit bigger and then that became the top so that the male and female could get inside. Here we go landing them. And as expected, they'll all probably dart away and hide until they get more comfortable and see where the tank is. Come morning, it'll be like they've been there forever. There's the two boys. You can see they're settling in. They're getting a bit of that bright baby blue on their eye already. And these were shot this morning, the day, next day. You can see their colorations back beautiful turquoise blue on their face and their eye. And there's a happy pair. Sifting through the substrate, looking for little morsels of food. It's been an emotional journey for me to see these fish again, to see the connection with these fish. Because when I bred these in the 80s, I gave these fish to Hugh, my dear friend. 
And I'm positive that these are descendants, many generations possibly, of those original fish. So it's been an emotional journey to have them back in my fish tanks. It's a species I will always cherish. And I love them. Watching where the buffaloes roam. Thank you for watching. Take care.